Uh, it's my very, very uh, great pleasure to introduce you, Yvonne. I'll, I'll talk about the camera so you can see me. Here we go. Hi. <laughs> Happy New Year. Uh, this is the Cook Islands Māori Language Group and um, Associate Professor Yvonne Adelhosteen. Do any of you know her? No, it's not. Okay. okay, all right. So, Yvonne is a Kukaraga in the UAN and also has got strong family links to Papua New Guinea as well. Wow. Um, and uh, works in the, the development studies at the University of Auckland, very much involved in gender, uh, geography, started out as a geographer, didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, gender and development studies across the Pacific. So, really looking at women's issues, those sorts of things. Okay, so the reading that she sent is in the uh, middle of so. <coughs> so thank you so much for taking the time out of your holiday and uh, your busy life. I um, really appreciate it. So nice to see you. I feel like it's been forever. It has. It has. Sometimes. But James is just telling me that uh, flights are daily on Air New Zealand for March, so we might see you soon. It yes. would be great. Yeah. All right. So without further ado, I will uh, hand it all across to you for our students who have been learning about different research methods, indigenous profiles, research methods around, and they're going to go back and do a little research project around. Their, um, so, yeah. good luck to you. All right. Well, uh, kia ora, ana, kia tato kato to. Um, kia ora, uh, Yvonne. I'm going to speak in English. I am learning Cook Island Māori, but it's very slow and um, <clears throat> doing it online and with my auntie, but I want to have as much time as I can to talk about my research, so I'll just speak in English. Um, but my family, my mother's is, is Jasmine Underhill, and um, she is from the Palm de Toe and Framheim family. And my father is Jack Underhill, and he's from, um, from New Zealand. Um, I was married to, my husband was um, Graham Sem, who is from Papua New Guinea. Um, and I have three children, uh, Lana and Kaita and Arus. Um, and I currently live in, in Auckland. Um, but I just came back from a little three-day trip around um, New Zealand to visit my brother, one who lives in the Wairarapa and my other brother in Porirua, and also my Auntie Deb. Some people might know um, Auntie Deb Tamaiva, um, who's staying with her, um, yeah, with her daughter, um, Helene, in Paraparambu. So um, I just wanted to, I, I've, um, I was born in the Cook Island, I was born in Rarotonga, um, and my parents came to New Zealand when I was just three. So I grew up in Porirua, and Many of you will be familiar that Porirua was a little bit of the Pacific um, in the time that I grew there. And I went to Porirua College and then I went to the University of um, Wellington, Victoria University of Wellington, where I started to study geography and also anthropology. Um, I was very lucky after I finished four years at Victoria University to get a scholarship to go to the University of Hawaii, where I continued my study of geography. When I was in Korea, my research projects was interested, was, was looking at Cook Islanders in the Wellington region, Cook Islanders who lived closely together in Puriro, and Cook Islanders who lived a little bit more further apart from each other in the Hutt Valley. So I was really keen to understand about whether people who lived closely together share more of their cultural heritage than people who lived further apart. And I've continued to think about um, Cook Islanders in all sorts of different ways throughout my studies. So when I went to Hawaii, I took my attention to looking at people who live on small parts of in the Cook Islands. And I'm because I'm from Mauke, from Naputoru, I was keen to go back to Mauke and interview people there about their connections to family and Purirua in particular. But as, as what often happens when your research starts, although I was very keen to go to Mauke, the interesting area at that time was the number of people who were going back to Manihiki. 
1983, I traveled up to Maniiki and I spent four months, <coughs> four months, five, four months in Maniiki. At that time, there was no airport. <laughs> so I went up by boat, came back by boat. And I was interviewing people in Manihiki about their lives in Manihiki, but importantly, how many times and how did they travel to Rarotonga or to New Zealand? So this is all part of trying to understand how people in the Pacific and particularly in the Cook Islands, how they migrate. So as I said before, my, my master's thesis was in Hawaii and I got a master's in geography from the University of Hawaii. And my professor at that time was a professor Murray Chapman. And so the paper that I sent out to read to you, um, for, for you to read is what we call a kind of a, a paper that you write to honor your professor. So um, there's a German name for it that I can never pronounce, Weistreff. <coughs> but it was a paper that students of his were invited to write to explain how his teaching influenced our research. So for those of you who had a chance to read the paper, you will sort of get a bit of an understanding, I think, of um, how his work influenced our work, but also how our research and my other students who were from Fiji, who were from, um, from the United States, who were from Indonesia and the Philippines, how our work and our communities also helped him. So the paper that I sent you is what we call a paper that is an argument. It's not a research <laughs> paper that collects data, you know, primary data, or even a research paper that collects what we call secondary data. It's a paper that makes an argument. And the argument I was trying to make in that paper is that in the Pacific, we understand migration in lots of different ways. It's not just a technical term about when you leave a place and when you arrive in another place. So that kind of paper is, it's a discursive paper, it's discursive research, it's a research around argument. So it's really important to recognize when there's research that is about an argument or whether it's about collecting data or analyzing data. And so just as a bit more context, after I finished my master's at the University of Hawaii, I met my husband and we, he was from Papua New Guinea. So we went over to Papua New Guinea and I was teaching at the um, University of Papua New Guinea and learning a lot more about how life goes on um, in a small village in Papua New Guinea. And so I became interested then the same thing about how people um, live their lives. And so my PhD um, research, which I did from the University of Waikato, where I know Debbie has worked, was looking a bit more carefully at fertility. So maybe you'll begin to see that within geography, of which I am, I call myself a geographer, one of the things we do in geography is we're all in places. And one way we look at that is through what we call population geography. So the population geography that I was working on was a Pacific population geography. And it was initially about um, the Cook Islands and Manihiki and Puriroa. So I began by thinking about my own environment, my own understanding of being a Cook Islander in Puriroa, in Wellington, and then coming back and going to Manihiki where I where I thought I had no context, but there's always a contact, right? Um, so this is what our often Pacific scholars end up doing. We start off with what we know, we start off with our experience and we expand it. So this is why in the paper, what I was trying to show is how fertile it is when you move around places. So when, for instance, myself, starting in Rarotonga with my family, moving to Puriroa, studying <clears throat> in Hawaii, 
moving to Papua New Guinea, all of this is what we call Pacific mobility. Mm. And one of the things that I was really interested in when I was in Manahiki was looking at what we call people's mobility journeys. And there were many and they were very interesting and complex. So we know people move for many, many reasons, for health reasons, for family reasons, for education, for increasingly people, you could argue, are moving because of the environment or at this moment, not moving because of a health issue. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand how different our mobility experiences are. Sometimes we move on our own. Sometimes we travel on our own. Sometimes we travel with our family. Sometimes we travel with friends. Sometimes <clears throat> And what I was interested in as a Pacific scholar was in the bigger frame of scholarly work in population geographer, geography, this understanding of how different mo movements happen was very, was not really um, studied. Um, and was not, there was not a lot of publishing around it, which is why I wrote this argument to say it is very fertile for our thinking to think about mobility and migration in all the different ways that it happens. And all of that began by starting with my own journey um, through the Pacific. So um, that's why, that's how we came to this paper. And the paper that I wrote, again, it was for a journal and a journal in, again, geography. So it's always important to know when you read a paper, what kind of, where it's been published, because that tells you about who you expect will read it. So I don't imagine that many um, of my first year um, Pacific Studies students would read my paper. You know, and I take my hat off to those of you who had a chance to read it. Can I get a, it's a little indication to see how many of you managed to read it a little bit. One, a little there's bit. Some, okay. There, there are some people that you can't see in the screen there. With okay. the not, but there were some other hands up too. All right. and, and in some ways it doesn't really matter. But one of the things I try and say my student to my students, sometimes it's not even about being able to read that whole paper because audience is not always for students. The audience for that paper are for other, uh, other lecturers and scholars like myself. It's mm. for them to change the way in which they think. So the paper I sent you, which is in parts, it's quite, um, it's theoretical, which is often difficult. So it's a paper that I would expect graduate students would be reading. So students who've actually moved through three or four years of university and are beginning to think a little bit more about how do you do things differently. And so um, I, I, I here must send a paper. I was very unsure which paper to send. Um, so I, that's why I wanted to give that, that context. It's saying that my, inter can you still hear me okay? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay, because I'm getting a message. Cool. Um, so, yeah, so um, I, I, I um, would like to open up a little bit before I go much further to see if there's any particular ideas in that paper that anybody wanted me just to clarify. <coughs> For those of you who didn't get a chance to read it, and I appreciate not everybody did, but if there was any question that anybody had about anything in particular in the paper that they wanted to clarify. Anyone? Any, anything? No. I think. Sorry. 
No, drink your cup of tea. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's why I asked the question so I could drink my cup of tea. Okay, so if that's the case, what, what I think I can do is um, go through it a little bit in a bit more um, detail, some of the key points that I, um, I wanted to make in this paper, some of which I've already explained, but I did want to highlight a couple of key points. So the first thing is that I just wanted to tell a story once about when I went to a conference in the United States and it was um, a paper, a, a, a lecture that was given by a really senior professor of population geography. And he was talking about the world and migration and mobility. And the map that he had of the world didn't include the Pacific. So, you know, so it was one of those maps that had no, that the Pacific Ocean was on the other side. And so I put up my hand and I was just a PhD student at the time. And I asked, where is the Pacific in your pitch in your map? And he said to me, oh, the Pacific doesn't count. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you can imagine, I was, I was furious. I was upset, you know, and I knew he was wrong. And yeah. so that yeah. would have happened in the 1980s. And so since then, I have worked really a lot to be able to say the Pacific matters in geography in particular and in population geography. So a lot of my research has been focused on showing how the Pacific, and in particular, how Pacific population geographies matter. <coughs> and so this paper oh, was, yes. Yvonne, sorry. Yes. My yep. name is Maya Shield from Mokitu as well. What I'm more interested in is the, this particular guy you're talking about. What he didn't understand or don't understand is even our people migrated from way back, well, Eastern Asia and down this way. Yep. So I'm upset too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can imagine that that particular event was a real mobilizing moment for me because it made me realize that if people haven't experienced the Pacific, even if they read about it, they still don't take it in. They still don't understand because another really important part of my work in geography is about people's <clears throat> ancestral and heritage in different places and in the Pacific. And we have to be explicit and teach that. So, you know, I was furious about that. More recently, I was involved, and this was a good story. Last year, I was involved in a little project with two Cook Islanders here in, in Auckland who, uh, who were running a little project with Latin America. So mm -hmm. they're trying to help um, Pacific creatives in, in New Zealand to um, work in Latin America. And many of the Pacific creatives said, why Latin America, you know? Why would we want to work there? But there was a really interesting presentation by a Mexican geneticist. And he showed the connections between Latin America and the Pacific. And he showed the lanterns and he showed the connections. So we know that we are connected in lots of different ways to other parts of the world. And, um, and so I guess what I was trying to say there is the initial experience I had was a strong motivator for me to continue to make an argument for why the Pacific has a particular, um, is a particularly interesting place to, to work and to do research in. Um, and, and I've continued to do that in different areas, but but as you know, you can, anger <laughs> can make you motivated, right, to do yeah. things. And so that was a real motivating moment for me. But that's why you will see that in this paper, I'm speaking mostly to other scholars. I'm trying to say to them, have a closer look at what you don't know. The Pacific is not a blank sheet, which is what he did to me. He said, there's no, no, it's, we don't have to talk, talk about it. 
So in this paper, um, again, I, I think if, if, again, if there's anything anybody wants to say, please interrupt and, and I can go into more depth in another area. Um, one of the things I'd showed in this paper is the connection between the Western Pacific and the Eastern Pacific. And do you, you know, you've probably heard a little bit about how we divide the Pacific up into regions. Uh -huh. And those regions are normally what? What are the normal regions we divide the Pacific into? That's right. That's right. And sometimes those categories are not very useful because, as we know, or maybe, but people know that, you know, Melanesia was a term that was first used because people in Melanesia were black. Mm -hmm. There was Melanesia. So the, the melanin, so the darker you were, that was why they called Melanesia or that part of the Pacific black. And then Micronesia was the small islands. And then Polynesia, of course, was this bigger group, which shared a lot more in terms of language, but they were also more, um, you know, they were browner. So there were some very troubling categories in the Pacific around the color of people's skin. And increasingly, we are being a bit more uncomfortable about using those all the time because we know that people moved between those regions much more than you might expect. And several years ago, I was living in Samoa, and it was at a time when um, there was a huge tsunami, not in Samoa, but in Papua New Guinea, on the co northern coast of Papua New Guinea. And because at that time, you know, my husband is from Papua New Guinea, so I'm part of the Papua New Guinea community. So we decided to have a, a bit of a fundraiser to raise funds for the village up there. Um, and we were a little bit concerned about who in Samoa would support us. But first of all, the Cook Island community in Samoa supported us. And then a large number of Samoans supported us because many of them had been to Papua New Guinea through their church through their sport and also through their families. So when we initially thought there would be a little bit of um, unease um, for people in Samoa to donate to Papua New Guinea, because at that time, the view was that they were dark, they were <clears throat> you know, not as well developed in their social um, interactions as others were. But in fact, what that showed was that there was a lot of connections between people in Samoa and people in Papua New Guinea. So the divisions of the Pacific into those three cultural regions is becoming less and less useful as we have more and more people moving across them. So just in the room, how many of us have been to any part of Papua New Guinea or Solomons or Vanuatu? <laughs> Yep. Or no people. Or no people in their family. Yeah. Okay. What about to um, the Northern Pacific? To Guam, Marshall Islands, Palau? Yeah. Nobody. No. That one, yep, someone has. Hawaii. <laughs> Hawaii. So, you know, we, it's probably surprising. Because, you know, in the past, our ancestors did move, you know, they did move between islands, you know, they did um, make contact and whether it was our, you know, my great grandfather, my grandfather was born in Papua New Guinea, and my great grandfather was from Niue, and my great grandmother was from Mangaia, and they met in Tutakimoa in, in Rarotonga, and they were sent off to PNG to be missionaries, and my grandfather was born there, you know, so when we go back and we have a look at our histories in the past we had a lot more opportunity to go between places to move between places and i have a very good friend from samoa and she was always given a hard time because she's very she's a dark skin samoan and that's because her ancestors came from the solomon islands and they mm -hmm. moved to the solomon islands as plantation um, workers 
and married into Samoa. And some of them are very dark and have got hair, you know, very, very different sort of hair. But she was given a very hard time in Samoa because she was dark and she didn't, she had frizzy hair and not, you know, the beautiful long hair that Samoans like. Anyway, the point is, in the past, if we understand our past, we do have connections. We did move um, across places. And we need to stop and think about why it's much more difficult to do that now. And if we think about it, it's about our access to transport right now. Let's forget about COVID for a moment. But even when we were able to move, the destinations you could most easily move to from the Cook Islands were Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could get to Tahiti, but how, is, how, how would you get to Samoa from the Cook Islands? How do you get to Samoa from the Cook Islands? You've got to go to New Zealand, Zealand then. Yeah. Even yeah. to get to Fiji, there wasn't even a direct route from the Cook Islands to Fiji. No. So that allows us to sort of, when we start to ask those questions about, in the past, our ancestors were mobile, they moved around, yeah. and now, our orientation has been determined by the options to, to travel, to the transport routes that we have. Even to get to Manihiki now, I don't know if boats go up there anymore, do they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's much more affordable to go by boat, right? Yeah. 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 But amazing what's happened with COVID, Yvonne. Suddenly they've got out of, uh, the Northern Group Island tours and Southern Group Island tours. And it's like, oh, way cheaper than it used to be, eh? Yeah. yeah. Funny how that happens. And I, I'm hearing from my family too, you know, who, um, one of my other, one of my other Auntie Kath, you might know Auntie Kath Kortika. She was just messaging me. She's in Aitutaki at the moment, or aren't you? So, you know, she's off island, you know, she's going around and looking at all the graves and cleaning them all up, you know. So, so when we don't have that transport infrastructure that was bought in by um, our development partners who are not the same as our traditional heritage partners or whanau or family, then we are going to be oriented to Australia and New Zealand instead of to the outer islands or to some of the other you know Pacific groups that we're much more closely attached to and to me that's what I mean by the fertility of mobility if you can be mobile then you can fertilize so many things you can you can learn more about yourself you can learn more about your relations so being mobile is a really fertile thing to do. And it's not just about migration, where you go from place A to place B for economic reasons, which is what you normally see in the literature. But instead, if we look at, if we had the chance to move, where would we go? And there were no impediments that we all had, we were all healthy enough to go anywhere. We were all wealthy enough to be able to, to, to go anywhere. And most importantly, we were always, we're also connected enough that we can go to places. Because we all know that once we stop going to those special places called home, the connections become different. They are transformed. Mm -hmm. And some of those are transformed for a whole lot of intervening reasons. You know, there might have been some bad um, blood at some moment moment there might be some arguments were never really, once we start to go back into those places and move around we can actually heal and deal with those um, relationships so the other key part about understanding how fertile it is to be mobile is that is to understand what we mean by relationships and what we mean by indigenous relationships and many of the, our, our indigenous relationships require us to be somehow face to face, somehow to talk to each other. And here I am in Auckland Central and Greyland talking to you all in, in, in Avarua, in Rarotonga? In Rarotonga, yeah. So um, we're going to have to change a little bit how we do things, but we could never, we should never forget 
about the time that it takes to have these kinds of conversations. And even though we are mobile, and we are mobile in many and various ways, the important part of being mobile is how you relate to people, both where you go and where you come from. And so this kind of idea, even though I'm getting a sense that it's something we all agree with, we all understand, we all get, this is not something that is understood in the wider scholarly um, community because the wider scholarly community will see us all as individual economic units. Mm. And, so and that's like your professor said, Yvonne, like what the, but like your professor said that there's no, like the Pacific is not important, but like when you're, when you stand in the Pacific and you just, that's all you know is the Pacific, then if that's your center, right? Yep, that's exactly yeah. right. And, and if all you know is the Pacific, and you actually then look at a world map, then you know that you know a lot. Because the Pacific is not small. The mm. Pacific is large. So we need to move away and we need to be clear that our connection to the Pacific, it is through people and it is to our heritage and it's knowing who our heritage is and knowing the aunties and the uncles who came from different parts of the Pacific and, and knowing where our, our, our fish comes from and knowing a whole lot of things about our environment. Um, we know we are connected and we know that the Pacific is central in so many ways. So when that, um, another little story I was gonna tell you, I was with a colleague of mine from Tonga and we were going to um, Cape Town in South Africa to do a conference presentation. And so there's a very long plane trip, I think 12, 12 or 14 hours to get to South Africa. And we were talking and she, I had been to South Africa a couple of times. And so I knew some of the people there, but it was her very first time there. And she was, <laughs> we had an hour presentation and in that presentation, she was going to spend about 20 minutes of it talking about the Pacific, Pacific region, the countries there. And I said, oh, maybe that's a bit too much. Maybe that's a bit too long. But she was absolutely right. She, we actually spent 30 minutes of our one hour presentation just talking about the Pacific because people in South Africa were fascinated. They had no idea about what it meant, how to live, what they thought in the middle of water. Mm -hmm. They had absolutely no idea. And so we spent much longer talking and introducing them to the Pacific Ocean, the mm -hmm. idea that we didn't live with water around our ankles. You know, for, from their point of view, all they saw was this big blue ocean and couldn't understand how people lived in it. Just as we struggled to understand how they lived in a continent where there was no water, where there was no fish. So it comes back to that same idea is that we do need to know where we're from. We do need to know what that looks like, but also we need to know who we connect with, both on a daily basis, on a monthly, on an annual, over our lifetimes and over the lifetimes of our, our ancestors and our family when we start to think now about some of our youngsters who are moving around, who are involved in sports activities or other kinds of activities, they're moving globally. Well, they were before last year. So now that we're in the Cook Islands space, you're very lucky. You can have these outer islands. You can go and fix up the graves in the outer islands, you know, instead of coming to that big that big place in the middle of Auckland, where I know some of my aunties make a come over to. <laughs> Instead, they're going to the outer islands. So um, maybe I can start to wrap up my little corridor here. And just to, again, um, you know, remind, remind you a couple of key points. One, when you do read an article, it's important to know the context of that article. How did it um, why is it important, you know, and who was it designed for? Secondly, when you do research, 
the most I would say fruitful research begins with looking at where you are from and what is it that you see in your world and always to remember that that's as important as anybody else's. But the third part is that it's useful to, it's always useful to know what the relationships are. So that's the relationships within your own lived experience, but it's also the relationships with people who are gonna read your work. It's the relationships of people who might be working in your research area. It's the relationships with your classmates, with your neighbors, with your workmates. Because we, while we might start off in our little place, we quickly run into those sorts of relationships. So, you know, three points. The context and the audience of a paper is important. I would say good Pacific research starts with where you are and who you are. But the third point is that it shouldn't stay there. It also needs to be able to connect to other people. And that's about the kinds of relationships you use and have. And so when I think about how I've tried to do that, I'm relatively comfortable with most of it, but the biggest shortcoming in my, my position right now is I don't have Cook Island Māori language. And so that, you know, that inhibits me. I, have, I would love to be able to learn that and that will deepen my understanding. So for those of you who have got good language, you know, this is a really important part to start. Um, but many of us like me um, don't have it for all sorts of different reasons. We're still keen. We still wanna be involved. We're still Cook Islanders. Um, so, you know, this is where the relationships really make an important, uh, make a difference. So I'm gonna stop there and um, just leave a few moments for anybody to ask any questions or if Deb you want to draw me to say a little bit more on something but um, really very nice to see you all. I have something to say um, just going back on um, the map yep. that you were talking about I had the same experience when I went to um, to Israel back in 91. Mm -hmm. um, I went with a colleague from Pereira College we went for a um, two months course on teachers and trade unions. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I went with Matthew Toia. Maybe some of you know Matthew. Mm -hmm. So we went to this, um, we were there for two months in Israel. Wow. Um, one of the professors there um, made a um, presentation. And it was the same thing as you were saying, the map. Yep. It, had, it didn't have the, the, the Pacific. Um, so we, I myself, I was prepared for, to do my presentation about the Cook Islands. And I did take a map of the world map with the Pacific um, Islands on it and also a Cook Islands map with just the islands and also um, a book with uh, each island within the Cook Islands. So my presentation at that um, course that I went to was pretty much um, very touching because there, we had Samoans, two from Samoa, two from um, Fiji, and two from Tonga. And they were upset as well because, you know, we weren't known um, the Pacific region in this um, course, but we put in a, a, we, I put a question before them. Why were we invited to this when we are not even, they don't even know us. So what it was, was quite, other? What did they say? They just said, oh, um, <laughs> they, so they went back and they went to look for a world map that had the Pacific on it. Mm. I said, I have mine, I showed them. And 
um, right here, here's the Cook Islands. I'm very small. This is where I come from. And then it had one um, Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, because we were the only ones who um, were invited to this um, course. So two months being there, um, it was also an experience for them. It was a learning um, time for them about, you know, the Pacific Islands. Yeah. So I'm just sitting here and listening to yeah. um, what you were talking mm -hmm. about. So it is very important that we make us known mm -hmm. out there because there are some mm -hmm. countries who don't even know about us, especially the Cook Islands. Yeah, yeah so thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That's a great story. And I, I imagine there are many like that. So I guess the message is don't ever take for granted that people know where we're from. Um, even in today's age, um, even with social media, even with everything that's happening, they might have advanced to be able to find us on a map, but then there's some deeper teaching that we can do as well. So thank you for that. Mm. Any other questions, people? No, I think um, no. We've had three weeks of a lecture each day, and just maybe we're we're, we're well, they've got me tomorrow. They better not, you know. They better be ready. For that. <laughs> I I you know I want to say th I think this is a fabulous course, and um, but also really hard. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Very intensive. It's very hard. So um, I'm very happy just to pop in, um, but I know that you guys have been working hard and intensely for a while. So um, congratulations, good luck in getting it done. And um, you know, I'd like to say I look forward to being in Raro soon. Yeah, oh, actually, actually, actually not Raro. If I come back, we had planned to go to um, Maoke for three weeks with my sister. So. Maybe just through Raro and back to Mauke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I think it's, um, you know, all of these people in the course are teachers and start school again, of course, on Monday. So they've, this is their fourth summer in a row that they've given up to work towards their diplomas. So yeah. I really salute their dedication, Yvonne. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I always tell the story that, you know, you can, you, it's a journey towards education. I did not, I, you know, I went to Porirua College. At Porirua College, there were seven of us. There were 300 who started as third formers, seven of us who finished. And when I finished, the first thing I wanted to do was to go and get a job. And my parents were quite smart because they said, you know, well, there's a job going up and, and, you know, and they gave me a little bit of extra pocket money just to get me over that thought that I need to go and work at Todd Motors because that's where I was going. So it's a journey, you know, and so even after I finished my, my studies and, in, in, you know, four years of a degree, you know, during that time, a lot happened. I remember losing some very close friends and many times you would decide it's too hard. But last year or two years ago, I had three, three PhD students who graduated. One who was a grandmother from Fiji. And the week before she graduated, or the week before she submitted her PhD, there was a tragedy in her family, you know, and she had to spend that extra week to finish. And then she went home to Fiji. Another one of my PhD students, you might know her, Dr. Tina Christina Newport. Um, <laughs> and so if you think about Tina, Tina's had, you know, she has had a whole life before she began her PhD and she has a full life. And even during her PhD, her, her dear sister passed away. Um, and then a student who was from Samoa and also had, just before she was finishing, she had a major family event, but she persevered. So small steps. <laughs> Just keep on keeping on going. And, you know, I, I think, yeah, teaching is such a fabulous thing to do. And I consider myself a teacher as well. So, but you guys are doing it the hard way. You're with the kids every day, five days a week, you know. Um, I'm an honor, did you? Um, yeah. Um, we're talking about acid geography. Acid geography. Uh, 
my experience being a Delta Bar, uh, it made me realize that um, looking at what God created, I, and we are, and I had that experience every time I look at the world, look at the map, look at, you know, the, what differences that created the world today, the movement of the oceans. And it made me realize, hey, um, you know, in the Bible, it says God created the heavens and earth. And by looking at all this stuff, am I looking at what God has done? And am I, you know, say, oh, this didn't happen, right? Or this didn't happen, or this, what changed? Yeah. And uh, looking at the climate changes, people today are uh, making their, um, their issues or trying to help. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And uh, it makes me realize that it's one of the very important subject or being a geographer, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. I always sometimes go back into the Bible and have a look at, hey, God created this at this day. And yeah. um, I'm yeah. really looking at it and trying to get things so the students know how, how they were made and what happened, you know, being a geographer. Yeah. So yeah, you, you really, um, Make that mind. Uh, make me think about it. Yeah. So, and I think, I, yeah, I think um, there are lots of ways to see the world. And I and I was uh, trained as a geographer, so why, that's why I say as a geographer, because I have good colleagues who are also historians, and they were trained um, to understand history in different ways. And mm -hmm. a lot of those do overlap. And then you get the overarching views from, say, the Bible, or from some other ways of understanding the world that doesn't include um, a, a view from above. A lot of people understand geography from their own small worlds around them. And that's just as important as understanding bigger pictures. So yeah, I personally find geography to be a useful subject, but let me tell you, when I was studying geography at high school, I did not want to do geography because we had to learn about American wheat fields and you know all these other things I said that's not geography for me um, and so we have to develop Pacific geographies and part of that will be uh, helping us to understand the physical ways in which the world operates the different viewpoints whether you come from a religious viewpoint or whether you come from a different viewpoint you know one that you know explains things in different ways but the as a teacher, I guess both you and in, in teaching and me in my education in my tertiary at the university, we've got to make it possible for everybody to find themselves in our teaching, right? So, you know, so I think that is the that's the interesting thing about being a Pacific geographer. Or a Cook Island geographer. Sometimes I call a Cook Island geographer. Kirana. <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing your, your research. And uh, you just uh, gave me some ideas of especially with your, with your research on mobility, the fertility. Uh, so the more movement you, you will have, the more fertility you'll be at. That's what's your argument. I thought, I'm trying to argue about Pukupukans being the more fertile in the Kukan. Yep. And I'm going to, to argue that Wi-Fi is more fertile than Kim <laughs> Yangato. So, <laughs> so I think that's why maybe because all the boys are mobility people, they can run every, every day, run, they just run, run, yeah. run. Yeah. And the Wi-Fi, they just go night, run, 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 run. So I, I, I will agree with you, you know, the more moments you have. <laughs> The more, uh, the more fertility you, you're going to become. And, uh, so just to help with uh, the girls that are having uh, menopause now, it's just mentality. It's just the reason, <laughs> no, the reason why, I mean, because I could think that they, there's their sickness. That's why they have been referred, because of women sick, uh, uh, not being fertile. Uh, so all these things. 
but thank you thank you that's why thank you for, for giving i will read more on your on your research on fertility and the, the mobility uh, that will help this is to it will give me examples of uh, maintaining the language too so the, that's why thank you for for bringing that in this uh, course and I'll be reading more about your research. One more question, Egon, on this side. Okay. Um, yeah. It's not a, a question, but it's a compliment. Anyway, um, Yvonne, I am, it's a milk and I'm from a and related to Not fair town. I am so proud of you, I am proud of you. Um, yeah. What I wanted to say uh, is that I love geography and history. I can hear so well. I love geography. Oops, now we're still related to that to your family. I'm Maku Tayash's daughter. Anyway, oh, okay. um, well, you I just I just great. wanna compliment you and I'm proud uh, you are Mokin and with a PhD. I'm trying and I'll try and see if I can get there. Anyway, I'm interested in your um I love geography, geography and history. Yep. especially in the area of traditional voyaging. Yep. So that's why I am um, here and I find your presentation very interesting and I know it will help me with my assignment. So, so thank you, Eva. Thank, thank you so you. much. And lovely to meet you. And you know, you have a fabulous heritage to live up to as well. And I'm sure your dad talked to you a lot. Um, so yeah, talk to Tina. Newport about her interest in navigation and voyaging too. But look, it's been delightful to meet you all. And you know, there is something called male menopause as well. But the thing is with male menopause, they never recognize it. Sometimes it starts as early as 30. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, hey, nice to meet you all. Okay. 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 Okay.